Jonathan Ross and welcome to the final part of Stop the World, it's Anthony Newley. For my money, Newley is one of the most underrated talents this country has ever produced. But as his Hollywood career began to run out of steam, another American showbiz institution came to Newley's rescue, Las Vegas. We've entered the theatre, they tore our tickets, we took our seats. Suddenly, the house lights go down to half. The orchestra begins to tune up. After the critical drubbing handed out to Hieronymus Merkin, his autobiographical movie Confession, Newley took refuge in the American cabaret circuit, where he based his career for much of the next 20 years. There, his act, mixing standards with songs he'd written with Leslie Brickus, served up with a heavy dose of that unique Newley on stage charisma, proved a big hit. Cut Light the lights, we got nothing to hit but the... Garth Barsley is Newley's biographer. Having been asked to open, I think, Caesar's Palace in 1966, I think it was 1969 before he finally got round to doing a cabaret. And immediately he was huge. He was just amazing. And within a couple of years, he was absolutely up there with Sammy Davis, Frank Sinatra, all of those people. Good evening, sweet friends. This evening, I shall be singing you songs composed mostly by my dear self and my colleague, Mr. Leslie Brickus. I used to sing songs by other people, but they never sang any of mine, so sort of. <laughs> so this evening, Newly sings Newly. You lucky people. I am the storyteller. The difference between Newley and, let's say, uh, Tom Jones at the same time was that Tom Jones brought in many, many people. His shows sold out. But the people that came to Newley's shows were the people from the East Coast and the West Coast, and what they tended to bring was money. And Newley's shows possibly didn't sell out. You know, it'd be 90% or 95%, but what those people came to do was to play as well. And, of course, his times when he was at Caesars Palace and Desert Inn, the tables were going all night, and millions of dollars were being brought in, so they loved Newley. They thought Newley was the man. Vegas was all about big, big stars, and Newley was certainly one of them. One of my regrets in life is that I didn't see Newley at his peak in Las Vegas, the era when he was voted the best performer in Vegas by his peers, the likes of Sinatra, Streisand, Minnelli and Sammy Davis Jr. Then I would have seen what the actor and writer Julian Fellows witnessed. When you did see him, when he was on stage... He was fabulous. And he had that thing that the audience were his friends. They were there to support him, to get him through the show. You know, it was the most extraordinary emotional bond. And he was a tremendous performer. I mean, I, I don't just mean that he had a good voice and he wrote good songs, but there's more to it than that when you're singing in public. And some people have got it and some people haven't. And he had it. Absolutely no question. Songwriter Don Black. I remember seeing him in Florida. I happened to be on holiday at, and I saw him at the Fountain Blur Hotel. And he was sensational, as always. And the audience stood up at the end. And I, I thought, well, on one hand, his career's going down in terms of Broadway and West End. On the other hand, as a cabaret performer, there was no equal, really. And there was a huge demand for him as a performer. I relate to that. I mean, if I was him, I would have done the same. You know, he was getting adulation and a lot of money. What more could you ask? It's a lazy man's life because, you know, I just did my act. I'm not saying it's all that easy, but it's easier than telling a story every night and having to make it come true. Singing a bunch of songs, when you get it down, is very comfortable. As Vegas took up more and more of Newley's time, songwriting took a back seat. But Newley and Brickers did collaborate on a few projects, including Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, starring Gene Wilder. The Candyman was a worldwide hit for Sammy Davis, and another song from the soundtrack proved the world was most definitely getting smaller, as musical director Ian Fraser remembers. Tony sang the melody to me on the phone from California. Leslie, I think, telexed in those days a lyric to me from Malta. I wrote the song down and sent a lead sheet by messenger 
to Walter Schaff, who was recording the picture in Munich. Come with me and you'll be in the world of your imagination. Take a look and you'll see. Newley would make up dummy lyrics, which were sometimes pretty nasty. A lot of swear words in them. But anyway, he he insisted it was, Come with me and you'll be in the world of my imagine. I said, Newley, it's, you're too be tough all the way. He said, no, it's come with me. And we finally, after about 15 minutes arguing back and forth, realized it was, come with me. The me was the downbeat. He was insisting come with was the downbeat. But those are the sort of things that went on at times. <laughs> After the commercial and critical success of Stop the World and Roar of the Grease Paint in the 60s, Newly and Britain... And Despite all his success and achievements, Newley was essentially an unhappy man, though the reasons for his unhappiness are difficult to fathom. Losing Joni was the saddest thing that happened to Tony because he never, ever was that happy again. He wasn't a happy person by nature. He had a very dark side, Newley. Julian Fellows. He was a strange guy. I mean... The French have a phrase that someone is bien dans sa peau, happy in their skin. If I'm absolutely honest, I don't think Tony was ever completely happy in his skin. He, in a way, he was trying to heal his childhood for the rest of his life. Part of it was with this rather extraordinary continued relationship with his mother, Gracie, who was very much in his life throughout Gracie was always the reference point. I mean, all the women who married him married him and Gracie. Then, in 1972, Newley came face to face with the father he had never known. Garth Bardsley again. When he met this man, thinking he'd, he'd find the answer to all the questions, who he was, why was Newley like he was, why was he so talented, why did all these things come out of him, why was he such a mess? And, of course, he met a little man living in London who was as ordinary, really, as his mum, Gracie. And it was a huge disappointment for him. And he tried his very best, I think, to make that relationship work, but it sort of didn't. And what he discovered was, in discovering his father, was that his father had been following his career for 40 years. He had uh, ticket stubs, programmes, everything you could imagine that, that followed Anthony Newley's career from being a child actor through to the 70s. So it's quite possible that when Newley was looking for his father in so many ways that he did over 30 or 40 years, his father was actually watching him out in the audience there, sitting, which is quite bizarre. As the 70s turned into the 80s, the appetite for Newley's style of cabaret began to wane. And with Hollywood, Broadway and the pop charts all firmly in his illustrious past, Newley's career began a slow decline. His problems were compounded by a cavalier attitude to money. It's no disgrace to be poor. <laughs> it's no great honour either. He would always say when things were going well, he always thought that it would never end because he was very confident about his talent. And he would say things like, royalty never carry money, Brickman. If I were a rich man. <laughs> Newley was profligate. He, he would moan to his wife about a, a telephone bill, but then he would give a, a dresser who he'd only met for a week a $500 present. Um, there was no sense to it. Lord, who made the lion and the lamb? Would it spoil some vast eternal plan? If I were a woman. Newly, though, was still bubbling with ambitious ideas, one of which was a musical based on the life of Charlie Chaplin, with Newly in the role of Chaplin. Julian Fellows took part in Read Foods for the show. He saw lots of parallels, you know, between him and um, Charlie Chaplin. That tremendous early success and then the continuous attempts to make it happen again, which was also true of Chaplin. He felt very strongly in sympathy with that. 
As ever, musical director Ian Fraser helped shape the songs and arrangements. But despite the Herculean efforts of all involved, Chaplin never made it to Broadway. The show was in many ways wonderful. I mean, some of his writing was quite amazing. But Tony could never bury his own personality enough to be Chaplin on the stage. Newley always came through, which I think was the problem with the show. Newley's longtime friend, Peter Charlesworth. He used to call me, particularly when things were bad, when Chaplin went down in America, he was quite devastated. Hey there, lady, remember me. A rare recording of one of the songs from Chaplin, Remember Me. Another big obstacle to Newley's career as a singer was his vocal style, by now full of over-the-top mannerisms and lashings of vibrato. Everyone did Anthony Newley, even me. Uh, Ian Fraser again. And the way Tony developed over the years, he almost became a caricature of himself. And I said something jokingly, but I realised that maybe it was very close to the truth that if Tony entered a Tony Newley impersonation contest, you'd come in third. I must say, after I've seen them do me, I, I do uh, I do have to go to my room for a minute or two to sulk because um, it's incredible because you never think you look like that. I mean, you never stop to think how you, how you move and how you sing. And of course, when you see somebody do it, it really takes your breath away. I realize, of course, that it's the greatest form of flattery, but um, it's a shock. It's a shock, as it would be to anybody to see yourself copied like that. But they always have to overdo it a bit, you see. They have to, da, you know, and, um, and I guess, um, yeah, at first it really took me back. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was unkind, but I realized, of course, that to people, uh, people recognize it immediately. And you have to overdo it a bit, you know. At the start of the 90s, Newley returned to the UK, living quietly with his mother in Surrey. His career seemed all but over. There was, though, a final curtain call from his songwriting partner, Leslie Brickus, one which reintroduced Newley to a public who had forgotten him or didn't even know who he was. Just as I was casting Scrooge, and we had a list of ten names, and I said, Newley is coming, I want Newley, and so I had to battle through Newley versus this one, Newley versus that one, but Tony won, hands down, and gave to me the best performance of his career alongside Stop the World. I think his, his little chap in Stop the World and his Ebenezer Scrooge were the two best things he ever did. Scavengers and sycophants, flatterers and fools, Pharisees and parasites and hypocrites and ghouls, calculating swindlers, prevaricating frauds, perpetrating goodness as they roam. Newley survived cancer in the mid 80s, but when the disease recurred, the prognosis wasn't good. Despite painful treatment, he kept working. Petula Clark. I had been told that he was, well, that he was dying. I, I found that hard to believe, but I was asked if I would record with him. So we went into the studio in London, and uh, it was so bizarre because we laughed and laughed. In fact, we were laughing so much we could hardly sing. It's very difficult to sing if you're laughing or crying. <laughs> and, you know, I had forgotten what fun... Tony had always been. He always made me laugh. It's easy. Let a little time go by and pretty soon before we know it. I've turned the two of us on one, two, three, and there we see our people tree. TV work also kept coming. A role in EastEnders as a car dealer should have been perfect for a boy from the East End, but it wasn't. And when he was approached about the part of a corrupt bishop in Jimmy McGovern's drama The Lakes, Peter Charlesworth had a tough job convincing him to take it. And he read it and read it, and he rang back and he said, OK, I'll take a swing at this. He was stunning. There is no other words for it. And he actually rang me at the end of it, almost in tears, and he said, you know, for the first time in my life, I really think I got it right. Had he survived, that was the direction I was going to push him in, because I've shown that to a lot of very eminent actors, particularly Michael Gambon, who said that was brilliant. And he was. However, that was the very last thing he ever did.
I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, Mrs. Quinlan. Hello. This way. So, you're a, uh, a waitress? Yes. Where? The Oldswater. Ah. Nice place. Not bad. Sit, sit. How are things at home? Fine. Do they know that you're a... Uh... No. Does your husband know? No. Is there anybody else who might... My sister. Your sister? She knows I'm pregnant, that's all. Mm. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, help us to discuss this matter with charity, clarity and compassion. Amen. Amen. Are you sure this child is Matthew's? Yes. It couldn't possibly be your husband. No. Why not? There is no way I can spare you this, I'm sorry. <laughs> we take precautions. Ah. Accidents can happen? Yes. Then conceivably the child could be your husband's. Conceivably. Oh, yes. No pun intended, I'm sorry. You want me to pass this child off as my husband's? No. What I'm saying is the child could well be your husband's. It isn't. How can you know that? Only Almighty God could possibly know that. Yes. So why not accept this child as a gift from God to you and your husband? You're asking me to lie and I just can't lie I about it. I am anything. not asking you to lie. I'm saying do not question the way God works. I'm sorry, I just can't do that to him. Hmm. What would your husband do? If he found out? Yeah. He'd do Matthew some serious damage. Yeah. Well, there are some who might say that Matthew had it coming. Would he keep it to himself? I don't know. The church has many enemies, Mrs Quinlan. They seize on the slightest whiff of scandal. Now, that can't harm a church that has thrived for 2,000 years, but it can harm the people who need that church. It can destroy their faith in the church. <laughs> I want you to go home, Mrs Quinlan. Swear your husband to total secrecy. And tell him the truth. He phoned me when he was dying to say goodbye. I'll never forget that night, because it was about 11 o'clock at night, and he said, hello, Don Dooley here. I just phoned to say goodbye, old dear. And I said, what are you talking about, Tony? He said, well, you've been very generous to me, old love, over the years, and I've had enough. I'm in a lot of discomfort, and I just want to say goodbye to a few old mates. And it was a most heartbreaking phone call. And a couple of days later... He died. He even went out with style. Newley's partner, Gina Frattini, was with him at their apartment in Florida when he died on April the 14th, 1999, aged 67. I remember him saying once, he said, oh, I'll probably have to die before people understand what I was doing, really, all the time. Tony could give meaning to a song better than any other singer I have ever ever, ever seen. Just listen to the songs he wrote. His records will be with me forever. The thing about Tony is he was always good to watch, you know. In show business, that really is what divides the men from the boys. The greatest talent I've ever worked with, and I've worked with some talents, was Tony Newley. We should be very proud of him. He was British through and through, and I loved him very much, and I still miss him. For me, and for his many fans around the world, Tony Newley is and always will be one of the greats, as I hope this series has proved. My thanks to the Anthony Newley Appreciation Society for all their help. Check out their website at www.antonynewley.com for more about the great man.
Let's leave the final word to the man himself, performing a newly song that sums him up pretty well. Look at me, look at me, I'm the funny man. Have you ever heard such clever stuff before? Applauded Time magazine, he's the laughter machine. I'm the man. And eyes is shouting to be fed. Get your head together for the second show. Make us laugh, Mr. Funny Man. Autograph, Mr. Funny Man. Fear will drink your whiskey while you think of her embrace. Trying to forget her, the letter of goodbye stares as you repair your painted face. When did she discover that the spotlight was your love? I ask my own reflection and I see the funny man is me. It seems the joke was on me But that's all in the dream Of the laughter regime I'm the man Who made This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs>Taking him away from his vocation. I'm not. All those people who need him. I'm not. All those people who need him a lot more than you do. That's not what I want. How old are you? You're no spring chicken anymore. It's always possible that there could be complications. It's always possible that the child might... May I stand, please? Yes, of course. There's a clinic near here, Mrs. Quinlan. A clinic? Yes, uh, we, we've used it before. They're very discreet, and we'll, uh, we'll of course, take care of it. You want me to get rid of this child? It's a huge thing to ask you, I know. But My daughter got him, pregnant if by If you love scally. your church, you'll do this no matter oh, nice what enough, it but takes. But you will do this speak, as please? soon as you can. May I speak, please? Yes, of course. My daughter got pregnant. Her whole future snatched away. And not once did she mention abortion. If it was unthinkable for my daughter, with her whole life ahead of her, why now is it OK for me? Because you're a married woman who's been having it off with her parish priest and been caught. I'm sorry if I'm being blunt. You're not. I am, I really am. But I don't think this is a time for either of us to get up on the old high horse. I know what you're doing. And it's got nothing to do with me or this child. It's about lies and deceit. That's not getting on my high horse. That's stating the truth. Yes, well... Would you like a drink? No. What I'm asking you to do is sinful, isn't it? Yes. Evil? Yes. And one day you'll have to face God and answer for it. Yes. And if God is hard with you, can you imagine how much harder it'll be on me? I mean, look at this place. The position I hold. And yet, 
I am the serpent whispering in your ear. Do you know how I'll defend myself before God? I'll say, Lord, you made me a bishop, but I envied all those simple priests marching with the oppressed, with integrity stamped on their foreheads, and they could afford that integrity because I'd been beavering away behind the scenes to pay for it and got my hands dirty doing so. Yes, I got this woman an abortion. And yes, I did many more other wicked things in my life, but I did them, almighty God, for you. I did them for the church. You could have asked for my life, but you didn't. You were more demanding than that. You wanted my integrity, my soul. Mere words. I'm not naive. I've picked and chosen. Bits of the faith that suited me, bits that don't. Meat on Friday, yes. Contraception, yes. But abortion, no. No. I think you'll have this abortion. I think you'll have it because you love your church, because you love Matthew and because you don't want to break your husband's heart. And when you do this, Mrs. Quinlan, it will be the most unselfish thing you've ever done. And God will love you for it. Jan Stevenson and this gentleman, who is most talented, he really has style. Mm -hmm. You know, when you got style, all the impressionists do you. And uh, he's a composer, an actor, a songwriter, you name it, he does it all well. He's going to be appearing at Harvard's in Lake Tahoe from the 1st of October through the 8th. Then he will be at the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas on the 28th for two weeks. Would you welcome Mr. Anthony Newley? Go on. This day and age we're living in gives cause for apprehension with speed and new invention and things like fourth dimension. Yet we get a trifle weary uh, with Mr. Einstein's theory. So we must get down to earth at times, relax, relieve the tension. No matter what the progress or what may yet be proved, the simple facts of life are such they cannot be removed. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss A sigh is still a sigh The fundamental things apply As time goes by And when two lovers woo They still say, I love you on that you may rely No matter what the future brings As time goes by Moonlight and love songs never out of date Hearts full of passion, jealousy and hate Woman needs man, man must have his name that no one can deny It still was a old story A fight for love and glory The case of do or die The world will always welcome Lovers
thank you for doing that. That thank was you, that was absolutely super. And great arrangement. And uh, thank you. Very only much. if you could do that. Yeah. Isn't that from uh, that's that, from Casablanca, isn't it? The original. As time goes by. Yeah. The uh, remember the, the last medley uh, as it is sung there is from my act. Do you remember yeah. the last uh, dialogue in the in that picture? No. No. Hmm? What was they walk to the plane with Claude Rains, and Humphrey Bogart says, "Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship." Remember, as they walk to the plane, and you don't That's remember, beautiful. none of you care. No. <laughs> Nostalgia usually gets them, but... Uh, Just a, a mine of useless information. That's right, I have a little trivia like that. <laughs> oh, that's super. That, is that, is that the you. whole thing from the act? Yeah. Sure. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Thank you. We're going to do this first, and we'll come right back. Yay! Thank you, Doc. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. We are back. And we're talking with Tony Newley. Rock and roll something, right? Yeah. Did you, did you see the rock and roll uh, award show I over heard. the weekend? Yeah, I heard. So. <laughs> wow. I want to tell you. People in the business come out and nobody seems to be able to read anything. Yeah. You know, what card, what winner is, can you, is that yours? No, that, I think that's yours. Where is it? It's Mind you, they've been smoking, mixing tobacco for about three is weeks. That, that, oh. Is that what it is? Oh, you mean you don't know? No, I wouldn't no, know about course, those things. Of course, you don't get out a lot, do you? Tom, no, very square. <laughs> Very square. Ask me a question, John. Anything. How are you, Tony? I'm in really good shape, babe. Good to see you again. Yeah. Do you have a tripod? Try it. I sprinkle it on my cornflake. <laughs> <laughs> you see, now, if you ask it, the reason I ask that, if you ask a question like that five or six years ago on television, first of all, they would cut the question. You, hey, you listen, would, you if you ask certain people you would not today, spot. if you ask certain people today, they, they wouldn't uh, answer. Yeah, they the wouldn't really answer it. And uh, does it... Does it do things for you? No, what I mean is, does, do you feel more creative? Are you more relaxed? Are no, you, uh... I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch it if I was working. Why are we talking about growth? I don't know. I just happened to bring it up. Uh... I had a perfectly good career till about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> this means... Do I this come means... out here and ask you if you go with girls of 17? <laughs> I did when I was uh, 17. <laughs> But I certainly, I certainly Things haven't been too good. Certainly would now, no. No, I think you have to have a cut-off uh, point. Oh, oh uh, sure. 17's a good one. Sure. <laughs> if you're going to have it cut-off, have it cut-off at 17. Hold, uh... <laughs> How old were you when you first walked on the stage, the stage and made your first professional I appearance? 14. 14? 14. This year, uh, this, this month, rather, I'll be 45. I've been in the business now 31 years. Yeah. And I still know as little about it now as I did then. It's incredible. I'm a very l slow learner, I, I think. What do you mean? You don't understand audiences or what? Not really. I mean, I've never really uh, been able to gauge uh, that kind of thing. No, that's not true. I can, I can tell how an audience is feeling pretty much when I walk out. Right. But I mean... Uh, and you, you can tell how you're doing when you're on the stage. Yeah. For the audience oh, yeah. reaction. But uh, uh, that, there are sort of uh, subtleties about the business that I've never really, uh, even to this day, picked up. But uh, I'm looking forward to the next 31 years. I'd probably get it right. Yeah. Somebody told me that you, you found it painful to perform. What do they mean by that? Yes, I have. Uh, uh, most of my performing life, I found it difficult to perform in front of a live audience. But as I say, I guess with the, uh, with the passing of the years, I've, I'm feeling easier now than I have. I mean, it's a pretty incredible life, John, yeah. when you think of it. And uh, I think if one could just appreciate it, um, it could be the best you know, the best thing to do. I mean, I've just come from my house now after pleasuring my lady. I roll up here and I get something like $300 just for sitting talking to you. I, th I can't think of many jobs that would be that pleasant. But that's true. You? That's true. Especially pleasuring your lady? <laughs> I guess that's an well, old, Engl old English expression, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in vogue over here. Um, <laughs> do you what do you it, want me to you, say? You, I've, already, no. I've already ruined my career. But no, you, do you find it painful per to perform from the standpoint that you want to be good all the time and you are afraid that the audience won't like you? Is that what it is? Uh, well, I, I guess as a performer, you appreciate that's why it. I you want to be nervous. best. You want to yeah. be good all sure. the time. And when you come sure. out and things are not going well, yeah, yeah. That's you set for yourself such a high level of As you can uh, tell from the sketch we just did before yeah. you came out. Right. Right. I, I actually certain, have a few notes about that sketch. We have a certain <laughs> level that we try to attain. Mm. Mm. 
As you say, the Leningrad latrine is richer by your performance. <laughs> well, I don't think you had to add to that. I already said that. Uh, what's the worst? Have you ever walked out and just absolutely nothing has happened? You know, um, where you think it's all going to go and... Uh, oh, oh, yeah. One of those terrible uh, disasters. Uh, yeah, some of the opening nights of our shows have been rather like that. I remember the last show we did, uh, a show called The Good Old Battle Days that Brickers and I wrote in London. And I had never intended to direct it or appear in it, frankly. I just thought no. we'd write it and I'd give it to some and get up there and do it. <laughs> but we couldn't find uh, anybody to play it, so I was stuck with it and directing it. And I always remember the opening night in a little town called Nottingham in England. As I was running off the stage back... Oh, Wait a minute, Nottingham. 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 This may be a first. I've never heard... <laughs> I've never heard Nottingham get a, get a hand before. That's, that's very nice of you. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, we were playing Nottingham, and as I left the stage to run, run downstairs and change and come on the other side, I thought, I'm going to be doing this for about a year. And this, the awfulness of it suddenly uh. struck me halfway down the stairs. And it was commie tragic, because I didn't want to be there to begin with. But the thought that I was now in a show, because I'd been so busy directing it right. that I hadn't really taken care of myself. And here I was running downstairs, put on another funny hat and come on the other side. And I thought, what am I doing? I don't even like doing this. Dick Martin and Dan Rowan told a funny story in the show one night when they were in their early days in a club somewhere in Chicago. And they were out in a nightclub and it was like a bunch of drunken legionnaires. And the A material didn't go. Nothing was going. And they tried every device. And they had a little piece where they get up and they march around trying to get the people, you know, yeah. to join in. And nobody was paying the least. So they marched right out the door. <laughs> Of the whole, you know, of the club, mm -hmm. right down to the room. elevator, went in, got in the elevator, and went to their room, and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> and they said nobody cared or noticed That's the difference. Right. They thought it was a finish. They just said, "This is it. We're leaving," and they split, mm -hmm. and just in the middle of it. <laughs> They're all waiting for another war. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I know you have to uh, cut tonight. Anything else you want? You want to mention? You're going to open the Riviera soon, up at up at the lake. Yeah, yeah. I'm rather rather looking forward to that. Uh, it's a very pretty place to play. Yeah, it is. And uh, we'll be at uh, Vegas too, and uh, right. with uh, Bert Beckwith. And... Right. But uh, do you wanna, uh, want me to chanson now? I'm if you'd like to chanson. Chanson, sure. Yes, sure. chanson de moi. Or... Okay, sure. Hmm. I'd, I'd like to sing, if I may, my latest record. Because if I don't, they break my legs, you know. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> you have the same agent that I used to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it? What's it called? It's called Teach the Children. Oh, yeah. Thank I know. It's a, lo it's a lovely song. Thank you. Lovely song. Thanks, John. Asked about his parents once replied Of all the undertakings God invented The parenthood career is most important Then he sighed How sad that only amateurs attempted We must soon realize That the happiness of man Depends upon his dear old dad and mother seldom understand the love and care a child demands how could they they don't understand each other teach the children of the world teach them now before it gets too late teach them how to be the parents of tomorrow for they'll become the parents of today and pass on all our hate and madness to a whole new generation. And so it goes ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Pleasure we derive upon this overcrowded earth in making and remaking our own image. When any fool could tell us where the gift of life's concerned, we take for granted what should be a privilege. The children of the world are doomed before they reach a school by families who are unprepared and careless. As long as procreation is a paradise for fools, the world will be the victim of its parents. Teach the children of the world. Teach them now before it gets too late. Teach 
them how to be the parents of tomorrow For they'll become the parents of today And pass on all I in my past To a whole new generation And so it goes out into my time At no Well, I just looked at my Anthony Newley Leslie Bricker songbook, and there it was. See? In addition to being a songwriter, an actor, a director, a screenwriter, a star on Broadway, television, films, and records, this little fellow has just won raves as the most exciting new act to hit the nightclub circuit since who? Since Tom Jones played Las Vegas. <laughs> no, no. Aren't those audiences fantastic? Yes and no, Tom. I, uh, I must say I appreciated your showing up for my closing night, but when they started yelling for you to come up on the stage and sing, I must admit I felt a little insecure. <laughs> well, what he said was, quote, It's good to see you here, Tom, but if you make one move out of that chair, I'll brain you with this microphone. <laughs> As you know, I do a single. Then there was the night Edward G. Robinson was out front, mm -hmm. and uh, I did ten minutes on this giant of the film industry, you know, a man whose name is a household word on everybody's lips, his place assured in the Valhalla of the acting profession, and then when I got to introducing him, I couldn't remember his name. <laughs> I went completely blank. So to cover my embarrassment, I thought, I'll keep talking. I did another ten minutes, mm -hmm. mentioning all his pictures, you know, Little Caesar, Public Enemy Number One, and again, when I got to the moment of truth, nothing. Luckily, my uh, conductor, Ian Fraser, whispered, Edward G. Robinson. Otherwise, I'd be there now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did that ever happen to you, Tom? No, me? No. No, never happened to me. Uh, what's your name? Me? Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, there's forgetting names, you know. I mean, it happens all the time, especially when you're under pressure. For I've got somebody who cares. Someone who shares my company Dump anything but pity on my plate I'm standing straight and I'm sitting pretty While I got me, I got a sky full of bluebirds When did you see someone as lucky as me? I'm all I need If I succeed I'll thank no one Who gives a damn What I am That's what I'm meant to be And there is no one in this world Who's gonna live my life for me Who's gonna share the worry and care Wherever the run Party's over It's time to call it a day 
They've burst your pretty balloon And taken the moon away It's time to wind up As I say, it's a tragedy really because I've, I've had a very interesting life and I don't remember much of it. And uh, that's the reason I didn't take the money when they offered me any order of it. Just make your mind up The piper has to get paid The part is over The candles flicker and stir You danced and dreamed through the night It seemed to be right Just being with her Now you must wake up All dreams must end Take off your makeup The party's over It's all over 